All right. So um, welcome. Uh, let me start by asking you um, if any of you actually still uh, recognize um, this uh, logo here. Uh, this, of course, is uh, the logo of the Heartbleed bug. Um, and the Heartbleed bug, as uh, some of you probably remember, was a critical vulnerability that affected the OpenSSL library in 2014. And of course, OpenSSL is this library that is responsible for securing network communications in Unix systems. And as a result, um, powers essentially um, on privacy and security in the majority of internet servers. And so um, this bug actually had a massive impact, uh, notably, and that's not the only thing that happened, but it um, um, essentially broke the, confidential the confidentiality of um, about 4.5.5 uh, million uh, uh, patient records of, of US citizens. And the industry estimated that its impact, the cost of, of its work, of, of, of the bug, sorry, uh, costed the industry about half a billion dollars. So I'm gonna be speaking a lot about money in this talk today, um, essentially because, well, money is at the, the, the heart of, um, of sustainability um, to, 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 well, at least to, to some degree. And so the Heartbleed bug is really interesting because it's sort of a pivotal moment um, where the tech industry suddenly realizes that open source is ubiquitous, Right, so um, two thirds of active websites in 2014 relied on the OpenSSL library to encrypt the, its communications. Also critical, um, OpenSSL, you know, was something that enabled private communications, bank transactions, uh, storing medical records safely, end-to-end uh, -end encryption, and, and all of these aspects. So it wasn't just like you know a, a nice, fun client-side library to add animation to your website. It was really core to how the internet functioned. And then, of course, the last bit is this is when the industry realized that not only was this ubiquitous and critical, but also open source was critically underfunded and that this underfunding was at the heart of the existence of this bug in the first place. And to give you an, um, concretely what that meant, it's OpenSSL, who was essentially protecting two thirds of, of internet communication, um, was maintained by one full-time maintainer on a budget of $2,000 a year. And so, um, this um, essentially pushed the, um, the industry as a whole to realize the extent of um, the sustainability problem uh, that it had. And this is when we started really hearing about the question of maintainer burnout, for example. Um, and really this opened, oh, sorry, this really opened the floodgates, right? Uh, people in the industry, the community, the maintainers, the contributors really started speaking up about these issues of sustainability. Um, and sustainability really took center stage. And as a result, rather quickly, we had multiple uh, responses or response attempts um, by different actors in the field and those, and it was a really broad set of uh, responses. And so in the first part of this uh, talk, what I really wanna do is sort of like cover a bit of the ground that exists and sort of like as a result of this, or rather that this 2014 uh, heartbleed bug sort of like, uh, um, accelerated, right, to look at these different options and then sort of propose a broader um, additional way to consider open source sustainability in, in the future. So let's get started. Um, one of the immediate first response of the industry was to create the Core Infrastructure Initiative. And uh, this was an industry-wide effort organized by the Linux Foundation and backed by pretty much all of the big tech corporations in the world was a multi-million dollar fund administered by the Linux Foundation and a steering committee of industry experts around security. And its goal was really to harden the security of key open source projects. So the focus was really, let's make sure that the open source key infrastructure that we all rely on um, is, uh, is sustainable, secure, and we don't bump into issues like Heartbleed again. Um, but of course, at, uh, at this point, um, we the, the the whole community was really sort of bought into this idea of 
um, well, we have a sustainability problem and we need to sort of fix it. And so maintainers, developers, open source developers try, try to find solutions of their own. Um, one of um, the, the first um, thing that happened is people used existing platforms that had been designed for other things like Patreon. Right, um, and sort of, and try to leverage Patreon or other other like-minded platforms um, to essentially fund open source development. Um, so, of course, the, the initial goal of Patreon was um, to to help artists, musicians, and writers create a meaningful revenue stream. Um, yeah, this sort of like was adapted to open source and actually quite successfully by some players um, in the field, notably Evan Yu, who is a picture here, the creator of UJS, who um, at that time was able to uh, turn over $17,000 per month, which uh, was enough for, for, for him to focus fully uh, full time on, on, on Vue.js. Of course, um, the, the question arises as to whether this is a reproducible um, solution. And in fact, um, it hasn't really been proven to be reproducible at a large scale, right? So some um, a few well-known developers were able to sort of create this and, and uh, build a large enough revenue stream to be able to work in open source full time, but this really wasn't common. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> sorry, uh, another approach was, um, um, is what Gitcoin created. And there is uh, a, a lot more interest today, again, uh, about blockchain-based solutions to sort of um, create um, uh, shared revenue about, amongst users uh, um, and creators of open source. I'm generally kind of um, dubious about um, the idea and how this works. Uh, also, because I, I have my own personal doubts about the um, uh, the, the underlying um, ideology behind blockchain, which I tend to think is very libertarian. Uh, but nonetheless, I think there are interesting efforts in that space, and it's really worth um, having a look at them and trying to to see what this this whole um, culture is looking at. And so, Gitcoin was uh, particularly interesting because it essentially created um, well, first of all, because it was a whole ecosystem, I and mean, it still is. Um, so it was Gitcoin, but also an ad network that now is defunct and sort of a patron-like solution called Grants. Um, and so the idea of GitHub um, of Gitcoin was to create a GitHub issue market where uh, people who needed um, uh, contributions to open source software would uh, have bounties and developers would um, uh, be paid for the work that they did. And so in 2018, it, it, it spent about half a... Um, a, a million dollar um, uh, paying out uh, bounties to developers. Uh, it also created Code Fund, which was essentially sort of like a way to advertise specifically to open source developers and really focused on um, hiring. And so that that got closed. It wasn't very, um, it wasn't sustainable. Uh -huh. uh, and it was now sort of replaced and endorsed by Code Fund. Uh, the replacement is Ethical Ads, which is uh, has a similar origin story, essentially trying to uh, build, um, uh, make open source sustainable, and really started being really developer focused um, and trying to ad advertise to developers, so uh, jobs, but also SaaS software, et cetera. Um, and it has served a, a billion ads since 2016 seen probably more um, uh, today. Um, but, you know, still uh, a billion ads is large, but it's also um, not a huge amount of money overall. Um, we're now seeing more and more of um, essentially, so this is OSS Capital, so essentially venture-backed open source startups. Again, here I have um, my own personal view on like how uh, really um, open source these are and, and, and how much they're actually trying to solve the uh, overall and underlying problem of open source sustainability. But it's also uh, um, an effort that is uh, happening. There's a lot more VC capital being invested, injected in open source, and that's also interesting to follow. Of course, um, and this wouldn't be complete without looking also at Open Collective, um, which essentially provides nonprofit status to open source projects and transparency as to how those funds are used. 
It's a huge success story is Webpack, which is making now, I think, close to half a million dollars a year, um, and which creates a really a win-win situation for key sponsors like Trivago. I've spoken about this in, in other contexts before. Uh, happy to chat about it um, after this talk. Um, but of course, the, the, the problem of Open Collective here, too, is the long tail problem, right? Key projects are uh, getting most of the funding. So, for example, Webpack was a quarter of the total funds that were given out in, in 2017. And so the dependencies itself is, is not really, the dependencies of like the key projects aren't really funded, um, which is why um, Open Collective has started Back Your St Stack project, which is essentially helping you, uh, consumer of open source, figuring out not only the projects that you use, but the whole dependency tree of those projects, and then being able to fund that whole dependency tree accordingly. Um, which um, incidentally is also uh, very similar to the model that Tidelift has created, um, where um, it's trying to essentially build a Red Hat business model for the long tail. Um, so providing security updates, maintenance, and legal assurance that um, for es essentially your whole open source stack. And it's doing so by actually paying the actual maintainers of the of the projects. Um, and so the actual success of Tidelift is, is still to be proven in the long term, but it's also a really interesting model. So I sort of gave you this, um, uh, you know, this um, uh, exciting um, um, view of all of these different pro projects that are trying to solve that problem. But I also want us to look at uh, the, the downsides and, and of that. And for this, we're going to look at four questions, right? The question is, does this um, funding-based um, solution to open source sustainability actually scale? Um, is money really the key question? Um, and even if money was the key question, is um, um, funding open source that way with open source developers on one side and a regular developers on the other a desirable outcome? And lastly, I want to focus on what the real value of open source is and make you reconsider the idea that we're essentially trying to um, find a way to fund the open source, uh, the code itself, and really consider about uh, more the value of community and of the knowledge and network that's built inside of community. So let's look at this at scale first. Um, and for this, I'm going to uh, use um, uh, this absolutely great um, diagram from demonocracy.info, which I'm using with permission, and um, which I think really shows the size of the problem that we're facing when we're trying to fund open source uh, through essentially charity-based funding like we've been looking at so far. Um, so this is a $100 bill. If you stack a hundred of those, you get $10,000. And this was the monthly revenue of Code Fund, the adver advertiser that we talked about. Now, if you pack a uh, hundred of those uh, dollar pack, of those uh, $10,000 pack, you get $1 million, right? And this um, uh, is uh, the amount that was collected by Open Collective in 2018, I think. And it's the amount that Tidelift committed to pay developers. Uh, out of the money it received from uh, its VC fund. Now, if we do some quick uh, back of the envelope math, we realize quickly that the worldwide develop developer population is actually substantial, right? We're looking uh, in 2018 as roughly um, 20 million developers. And if we do math for this um, and estimating that a developer costs roughly $65,000 in the world, um, on average, uh, we get to a total cost of paying developers in the world, that is $1 trillion, right? So I want to sort of compare this notion of $1 million, which is roughly, you know, in the vicinity of what we're paying out to open source, to fund open source, or, you know, in the millions of dollars, to what we're actually paying as an industry in um, wages to developers worldwide. So if you take... Um, if you stack, um, uh, you know, uh, if you create a, a stack on, on a wooden pallet of $100 million, that's what it looks like, right? Um, now, if you get 10 of those, you get to $1 billion. And now to get to $10 billion, you're making a, a square of 10 by 10 pallets of um, uh, um, uh, 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 
what was it, $100 million each? Um, and if you actually want to get to um, a trillion dollar, well, you have to stack a hundred of those. And it gives you a tower of bills, of dollar bill, of hundred dollars bills of the size of a huge skyscraper, right? So to compare, here's your $1 million down there, and here's your, your, trillion, your trillion dollar, right? So the, the, the discrepancy between what we're trying to spend and the size of the problem means that it really is hard to make scale. So the second question is, is money really what's missing? And the answer to that is actually um, in nuanced, right? So for example, it depends on the project, obviously, but for a number of projects, um, for example, here the Linux kernel, most contributors to the Linux kernel are actually employed to work on the Linux kernel. So the question of sustainability here doesn't really isn't the question isn't really are people paid or not. It's are people given enough time to work on critical infrastructure. Um, the um, third question, and I think this is a key one, is is it really a desirable outcome to have on one side? charity funded open source developers and on the other corporate developers or developers working for agencies which are essentially writing glue code um, to combine all of the software that's built elsewhere. And for that, I want to quote um, DH Ainge, which wrote in 2013 the following. Part of the reason much of open source is so good and often so superior to closed source commercial projects is the natural boundary of constraints. If you're not being paid or otherwise compensated directly for your work, you're less likely to needlessly embellish it. You're solving the problems for you and your mates, likely in the simplest way you could, so you can get back to whatever you originally intended to do before starting to shave the yak. So what DHH is saying here is um, the fact that open source is created by developers that are actually building real applications um, is uh, important. It creates open source that is of better quality because it really solves the real problem that the community or that they're trying to solve and isn't trying to become a product that's attractive um, and that wants uh, to be bought, right? So I think that this notion that there is value in really um, having developers contribute to open source, I think um, um, is a really important one. And lastly, um, I really want to look at the question of the real value of open source um, and uh, insist on the fact that it is beyond time for us as an industry to look uh, beyond the value of open of the code itself and really look at the broader picture of what open source is um, and essentially as open source in terms of the community of practice and a, a culture and a, and a set of, of ways to develop software and not just the code itself. And for this, I'm just going to sort of like close this uh, uh, talk with this um, uh, diagram, which sort of like explains the way we look generally tend to look at the problem of sustainability in open source from a corporate uh, point of view. And uh, essentially, what we have here is on on you know on the left corporations. In, on the right, sort of like open source, and open source is represented by a pool of commons in which the, the software is swimming, and by sort of like the mythical creatures around it, which are open source developers. And so the way we look at this is essentially corporations just use that open source software, right? And when there are problems with open source software, it's not you know good enough, or there are security issues, um, the the default mode of trying to fix the problem is to throw money at it, right? Which is, you know, very much how a Silicon Valley industry sort of uh, thinks is like, let's throw money at the problem and see if that helps the problem disappear. And so the idea behind this, of course, is by throwing money at the problem, this is going to incentivize open source developers to contribute to the pool of commons. And as a result, uh, the corporations will be able to um, uh, benefit from the perceived value, the source code of open source. And in reality, what's really important to understand is that the, the real value of open source, and, and there's like, in, in, you know, increasingly um, research that tends to prove and show this, is not so much in the code that's being produced, uh, because that code is essentially free to use, right? It's completely commoditized. 
And so that, that's not really where you can capture value. No, where you can create and capture value is in how the practice of open source makes your, your company um, faster and more agile, how it builds um, a network of relationships across uh, different teams and different corporations, um, how it helps your developers um, um, level up, increase their knowledge, uh, increase their network, uh, increase their understanding of the underlying technology on which you're building your own software, et cetera, right? And so the, the truth is that the real value of open source um, is really um, what those developers take back home um, to their own company as a result of being contributing to um, this um, a pool of commons and as a result of being part of this community in with whom they interact and with whom they, they actually create software. And so we need to really stop looking at corporations as this um, solid entity and really think that a corporation is actually fill, full of, of, of people that can also themselves be contributors that so that instead of like throwing money at the problem, you essentially throw people that can participate in the underlying community and um, as a result um, benefit from um, the same networking and relationship building effects um, of participating in the community and bring back that value to the corporations. And so essentially um, what I'm here to say is although charity-like funding is um, going to be useful in some scenarios and is valuable uh, to the community, it's not alone by itself on the solution. And the real way forward really is to normalize engineers contributing to open source as part of their day job. And the question, of course, is how do we do this? Um, and to me, like, the, the key to that is exactly how we got corporations to use open source a decade or two decades ago. It's to make them understand the return on investment of contributing to open source. And um, that's it. Thank you so much for listening and I'm happy uh, to uh, take your questions. Thank you very much.